Good morning, everyone. My name is Wei Lu from Institute of Education, National Chengong University. I'm very honored to be here to be the host of this uh, keynote speech. Today's keynote speech speaker is Brandai Yo, a professor in National Singapore University. Who, uh, she's also the director of Asian Research Institute, which is established in 2001. And it aims to provide uh, interdisciplinary research on the Asian region. I just visited this center in February, and I found that the center is very successful in terms of um, research productivity and warm atmosphere. That's all because Dr. Yo's leadership. Dr. Yo's uh, research specialties are transnational migration and families and gender politics. The topic she's going to present today is plural diversities and the limits of hyphen nation, uh, the view from Singapore. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Yo. Uh,早上好,我要,很抱歉我的华文讲得很差,所以就要用英语,呃,呃,so, let me start, and as, it was already introduced, I'm going to take everyone from this very beautiful island of Taiwan to another, I'm not sure, equally beautiful island of Singapore, and this talk is basically about migration, and its effects on uh, plural diversities in the nation state of Singapore, looking at some of the cultural politics and the limits of hyphenation. Uh, the talk is in about five parts, so let me begin uh, with the first part, which is basically to introduce uh, Singapore and its history, looking at uh, both old and new diversities in this post-colonial nation city state. I've hyphenated nation city state and I'll come back to that uh, at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, this picture is basically uh, how the schools in Singapore celebrate the Racial Harmony Day, uh, where the children basically come in their so-called uh, cultural or, or, uh, costumes representing their race. Uh, and you see here all um, oh, um, the little kids dressed in uh, a time reflecting Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other cultures. So, uh, Singapore's place and time. So, as I think uh, people here know, uh, Southeast Asia is sandwiched between very two very large polities, the of uh, China and India. And uh, as the uh, place in between these two large civilizations, Southeast Asia has had a very long history of migration, of mobilities, and of circulation connecting diverse societies. And the migration streams range from uh, merchants, monks, sailors, to rebels, and of course, the, the coffee trade of the 19th century. So from its emergence as a British trading port um, in the early 19th century, 1819. In fact, this year is uh, Singapore is celebrating its bicentennial year. Um, it was uh, 200 years since the British uh, came and founded a trading post on Singapore. So, from its emergence as a British trading post to its current ambitions to become a global city of global business, basically Singapore's fate and fortunes have been very deeply intertwined with this migration history. So we started as a very small island state, uh, it's very scarce and there are there were basically no natural resources whatsoever. And it's, the city has been very much part of a global service capitalism uh, from day one. And uh, here is a picture of uh, colonial Singapore, uh, where it gained importance as a trading post. And it had, at that time, already a very liberal, open-door policy on immigration. And fast forward 200 years to the age of globalization today, where Singapore is basically a one global city, competing for a place in the top league of nation states and cities. And again, it's now beginning to play the role of a global hub, a 
a convergence node for transnational flows of people, of commodities, of, uh, of money, and of ideas. So let me uh, say a little bit about this history, a very brief history of Singapore. Uh, that was established uh, in the early 19th century as a trading emporium. And at that time, Singapore already had a very cosmopolitan demography, culture, and landscape. Uh, and here you see a, a very early map of a family map uh, that Raffles instructed uh, Lieutenant Jackson to draw up. And what's interesting about this Jackson Plan of 1822 is the way that the different uh, racial groups are, are, are placed. So you probably can't see, but uh, he designated different kampongs or ethnic precincts for the Chinese, so that in Chinatown, uh, for the Indians, that in Little India, for the Malays, uh, they, they basically conglomerated around Malay royalty in, in the uh, called Kampong Glam, and so forth. And only the Europeans are uh, in the center farm in the center in European town. So this kind of um, um, sort of planning that takes racial groups um, and group them in particular places um, has been analyzed and what's been called uh, by, by this uh, British officer called Pernibo. He calls Singapore basically an example of a plural society. And or what's a plural society? A plural society is one where each group, each racial group, basically holds by its own culture and way of life. Uh, as individuals, they think, but only in the marketplace when buying and selling. So in that sense, um, when it comes to economic activities of trading and, um, and, and buying and selling, uh, people meet, but uh, beyond that, in terms of their ways of life, their cultures, the different groups, the Malays, the Indians, the, the Chinese, live very separate lives. So this is the colonial model of plural societies that Singapore inherited. Um, so Singapore is basically uh, the demographic child of what we might call overlapping diasporas, where from the very beginning, um, it's geobody basically embodies many of the tensions of that and belonging that the concept diaspora evokes. Um, and um, you see here um, early model of Singapore's uh, North Boat Key that was presented in the Colonial Indian Exhibition in London in the late uh, 19th century and to showcase the diversity of peoples in Singapore even at that time. So the streets basically crawl with different kinds of uh, occupational groups um, and uh, nationalities and uh, uh, at, 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 at ethnic groups. Uh, of course, um, women tend to be a bit underrepresented in the city, but you see them keeping up on the windows on the upper floors. Right here, right? I mean, uh, so, so these women, women are also found here, although there are also some women in the marketplace involved in uh, buying and selling. So, um, this kind of diversity was also made even more complex by processes of mixing, of fusion and hybridization, creating creolized cultures which are adapted from multiple cultures of origin. So an example would be um, the uh, Paranakan culture, which is um, basically a fusion of Chinese, Malay, and Western influences. So these would be uh, Chinese people who came to the region from the 15th century, from the Ming Dynasty, basically, and uh, have been living in Southeast Asia uh, for a very long time. So they adapted themselves to both Malay culture and with British colonialism also have been very much influenced by the West. So uh, their women basically uh, wear skirts like mine, so batik sort of skirts, and they speak the community speaks uh, Baba Malay, even though, uh, of, of course, they are also uh, they are basically of Chinese ethnicity. Um, so, uh, to, to fast forward the story, by the time we get to the 1950s and 60s, Singapore was on its road towards independence. It was a very rocky road. I won't go into the story, but uh, we gained independence in 1965 when we were separated from Malaysia. 
right? So Malaysia decided that uh, we should part ways, and uh, so we came out as a, a sovereign nation state. And at that time, basically, uh, the immigration laws had to be modified to reinforce Singapore's borders uh, as part of nation building. So from the very open door policy towards migration in the colonial era, by the time you get to the 60s, these boundaries were increasingly tightened because it's now we now need to, in a sense, create the, the, the creature of the Singapore citizen, right? And here, legislation governing citizenship was suggested. I won't go into the details, but if you're born, if you're born in Singapore, then um, I, I didn't do anything. Uh, okay, so that if you're born in Singapore, then you are automatically conferred Singapore citizenship. If you are uh, born in Malaysia or uh, the, the United Kingdom or its colonies, then you have to be resident for a certain period of time before you can gain uh, citizenship. Those from China and the large masses are what's called aliens from China have to uh, endure quite a long period of residency before they can be naturalized citizens. So uh, for, for myself, for example, my parents were actually uh, Malaysians. They were born in Penang and they basically um, came to Singapore to find work. I was very fortunate because I was conceived in Penang, but I came out in Singapore. So I'm Singaporean from day one. My parents basically were Malaysians who then, after a long period of residence in Singapore, um, became Singapore citizens. So, um, so in the first few years of independence, in the 1960s basically, uh, there were very strict controls on the imports of foreign labor uh, and uh, the boundaries uh, of, uh, around the island state was basically hardened. But that did not last because Singapore had to undergo uh, industrialization in order to, to survive. So by the time industrialization went into full swing from the late 1970s onwards, we now see again an opening up uh, to the influx of foreign labor uh, to, in a sense, allow Singapore to grow at, at, in its industrialization efforts. So, and then fast forward a few, uh, a few uh, decades to the end of the 20th century, to the last couple of decades, basically we see here a new dynamic with declining fertility rates among the citizen repopulation, so our fertility rate is uh, lower than uh, one point, it's about 1.16 uh, and basically is in the ultra low, low range. So um, that has to be coupled with labor orientation programs through aggressive immigration policies in order to ensure that uh, Singapore is able to survive. So um, that's the the story so far. So what the picture show, you look at that, is the um, influx of new kinds of people from many parts of the world uh, into the island states of Singapore, creating uh, what this other picture shows, diversity Singapore. Okay, so, um, and uh, to show you some very basic numbers, we compare uh, Singapore's population in the last 10 years, 2008 to 2018, we see that the population has grown from 4.5 million to 5.64 million. So there's a growth of more than a million uh, over 10 years. Uh, and uh, basically what's interesting is if you look at the red portion, the Singaporean citizens, the citizen tree, the proportion of citizens have, uh, in a sense, fallen from 68% to 62%. So less than two-thirds of the people on the island of Singapore are citizens of Singapore. Uh, the rest would be either the permanent residents, the 10 to 10, about 10%, and uh, the very large number in grey uh, would be uh, the non-resident population. These would be uh, everyone from foreign workers to uh, expatriates. I'll go into that a little bit more, but as you can see, um, about 38% of the people on the island of Singapore are not Singaporeans. 
and uh, that has an important uh, consequence for diversity, which I'm now going to, in a sense, talk a little bit about um, yeah, in uh, uh, the first of my piece. So I'll come back to this picture in a while, but uh, my first sort of theme that I want to discuss is, in a sense, how plural diversities lead to unanticipated encounters. Um, and uh, here, again, going back to the uh, early uh, phase of Singapore's nation building in the 60s, uh, in this immediately after colonialism, um, against a backdrop of a plural society with racialized categories that have been hardened by colonial policy, the new national leaders in Singapore uh, advocated bringing the heterogeneous groups of people together into one people on the premise of this ideology of what's called separate but equal multiracialism. Um, and I will say a little bit more, but as you can see in the picture, it's basically about uh, the different races represented in Shiva children holding hands and singing the national anthem under the national flag. It's about, uh, as the stem says, Singapore, many races, one people. So what is this separate but equal multiracialism? Um, basically, in Singapore, uh, there are four official races, uh, Chinese, Malay, Indians, and others, uh, what's we call the CMIO model, right? And uh, this is usually represented by, um, again, by children dressed in their different uh, costumes representing each uh, cultural and ethnic group um, waving the national flag. Um, and this this cause of multiracialism is is basically one of four acts uh, that's the founding ideologies uh, of Singapore: is multiracialism, multiculturalism, multilingualism, and multireligiosity. So uh, the idea here is that these uh, different races, cultures, language groups, and religions basically are separate but equal. Uh, in order to encourage acceptance of coexistence amongst the different groups so that uh, people can practice their customs and traditions without discrimination for any particular community. So of course this is the, the basic um, sort of philosophy. On the ground is of course a lot more contested than, than what it says on, on, in, in terms of it. The broad ideology. So, just to give an example, in our housing estates, in our public housing estates, there are ethnic quotas. So, as to how many Chinese, Malays, and Indians can live uh, in a particular precinct in order to prevent the, the growth of uh, ethnic enclaves. Uh, in terms of language policy in schools, um, all, all of us, and this will probably explains why I'm speaking English, uh, have to, in a sense, uh, learn English as a common language uh, that every all, all, all children have to learn. So, uh, but we are also then expected to learn your so-called mother tongue. So if you are Chinese, then you are supposed to be able to say wo, 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 ni, woman. If you are Malay, then you are supposed to learn Malay, saya, awakita. If you are Tamil, uh, I can't pronounce the, the Tamil there. Um, and uh, basically there are four official languages. Right? I mean Chinese, um, Malay, Tamil, because most of the Indian uh, immigrants are from Tamil and Nadu, but everyone in a sense uh, able to communicate with each other using the lingua franca of English. Um, so that's the uh, multiracialism ideology. And uh, this ideology has in a sense been the uh, foundation for Singapore over the last 50 years. As you can see here, these are basically just proportions of Chinese, uh, Malays, Indians, and others. The proportions haven't changed very much. You know, I mean, um, if you look at this one, there are small increases in the in amongst the Indian and other category, and small decreases amongst Malay and Chinese populations. But essentially, the racial arithmetics, as we like to call them, uh, remains fairly stable. Um, and so. This then leads to my uh, point about uh, old and new diversities. So if you see here, what we have is the old CMIO diversity amongst the resident population. 
right? And but so remember, the resident population is basically the Singaporean citizens and a small sort of permanent resident uh, section. This this uh, say two thirds of uh, Singapore's uh, population is already quite diverse. They are diverse in terms of C M I O, right? Okay, so uh, and uh, but with the new uh, migration net diversities of the last couple of decades, there's also a new source of diversity amongst the non-resident population, new source of migration net diversities, I call them, amongst the, the non-residents, the, the bit in green, the one third of the population that can come from almost anywhere. Right? So you add the old diversities, plus the new migration net diversities, then we have a very colorful kaleidoscope of diversities. Okay, so that's the, the point I want to make. Um, I, I won't go into the details at the moment. Let me then, in a sense, uh, uh, say what consequences are of having this kind of plural diversities combining the old and the new. Uh, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is that it leads to all kinds of unanticipated encounters. Uh, recently, it's been said that Singapore sits uncomfortably being predominantly Chinese. So we have about 74, 75 percent Chinese in terms of its demographics and anti-Chinese because there's been quite a, a lot, especially in social media, protesting the influx of um, largely native Chinese immigrants. So the waxing and waning of social tensions arise from uh, the contemporary migration flows from India and China. So uh, this is, um, I, know, I, I know in Taiwan we're used to it, but in Singapore we hardly ever have a protest. If you have to get a police coming to go and protest, and there's only one place that can go in Singapore to, to stage a protest. But um, even despite the strict controls, in, in 2013, there was a white paper protest when uh, the government released a paper about uh, increasing the numbers of immigrants into the country. Uh, as you see here, the tagline uh, amongst this uh, 5,000 people, uh, which reflects the whole diversity, right? You see the Chinese Indians in the base. The 5,000 people protesting uh, on a rainy day in Singapore uh, is uh, Singapore for Singaporeans. Okay, so it's um, in a sense a uh, very uh, nationalistic kind of a protest. Uh, and um, this is again a reflection of the kinds of um, more subtle tensions. So you have protests on one hand, you also have sort of uh, uh, tongue in the cheek sort of uh, cartoons like this. So when uh, China gave uh, Singapore uh, two pandas as part of panda diplomacy, Right, um, the panda were flown uh, in aircon com comfort to with their own special bamboo shoes and uh, entourage of zookeepers, and they were given a very beautiful uh, aircon surroundings on our Singapore's River Safari. What it stirred up is envy from the locals here, represented by the orangutans, who are natives of uh, this part of the world. They whisper amongst themselves, "Foreign talent." Treated in a, uh, a, a with a red carpet sort of rotor. So uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to show is the kinds of subtle tensions uh, in Singapore in relation to uh, migration net diversity. And this is uh, a classic example of what tensions uh, can produce. So this is a, a while ago now. I mean, um, um, there was an immigrant Chinese family. Uh, uh, was in a sense become new citizens in Singapore. Uh, we live in HDB flats, so basically they are flats which are very close to each other. Uh, they complain about the smell from the curry that was cooked by the Singaporean ethnic Indian neighbors. Right? Okay? So uh, they went to mediation court, and what's, what was, I think, uh, quite ridiculous for many people is that the, the mediation court says. Well, uh, when the uh, Chinese family is at home, can the, the, the Singaporean Indian family not cook curry? Can you refrain from cooking curry? So that basically uh, got all the citizens up in arms. They retaliated by calling on all fellow Singaporeans 
of all races to deliberately cook Indian, Malay, vegetarian, Eurasian, Chinese, Maranakan varieties of curry. We have many varieties of curry. Uh, on a particular weekend, as a show of solidarity with the Singaporean Indian family, um, and as a form of anti, so-called anti-immigration protest. So this incident I brought it up because it's a little, it's hilarious, but it basically, in a sense, shows um, how the the fact that uh, this is the the tensions do not just fall neatly along racial lines, they cross uh, many different kinds of uh, different lines, um, yeah. Okay, so, and just to say that this cook a pot of curry has lived on uh, in the form of a, 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 a play, uh, as well as it's now celebrated every year, it's on National Day, uh, as a way of remembering curry as a positive thing, uh, that is not only really divide people, but unite people. So, um, so here, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a very complicated sort of politics and paradox of distance and proximity that divides some and unite others uh, in a post-colonial context of Singapore. Uh, this is, of course, a very different kind of uh, racial politics from um, white majority countries in the West, where it's largely uh, the, the dividing line is between the whites and the others, and it's very consistently in line with majority minority identifications. And Singapore is not, it's very mixed up. So, in the face of these sort of strongly racialized contours, uh, race diversities are often pluralized, leading to these kinds of unanticipated uh, encounters that do not necessarily resonate with expected racial categories. Right? So, that's. Um, that's my sort of uh, second sort of uh, major point. The third uh, point that I want to make uh, has to do with uh, uh, spaces of appearance, um, to do with uh, how, in a sense, the kinds of cultural politics that I've been talking about plays out uh, on the ground. Uh, and that's just a, a picture of Little India uh, in Singapore during Deepavali, uh, where it's a uh, uh, gathering grounds for not just the Singaporean Indians, but also a very large uh, groups of uh, migrant workers from India and Bangladesh. Okay, so in Singapore, uh, I think just to keep this quite short, but uh, there is a, a hierarchy of, uh, of migrants. Okay, just to just to put it very simply, uh, there are talent migrants, those who are highly skilled professionals and entrepreneurs. Uh, these are often uh, welcome into the, the city state and incentivized to take up uh, permanent residency or to lay down roots. So uh, these could be scientific talents. They, I mean, uh, for example, uh, in my department in uh, National University of Singapore, uh, now about sixty percent of my colleagues will be non-Singaporeans from somewhere else, and they bring in sort of uh, highly uh, their skills and their talents uh, to, the, to the university. Uh, so this will be represented by the three men down there. Um, it's, there's a gender question which I won't go into, but uh, it's kind of largely male as well. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, at the bottom of the hierarchy, so to speak, uh, are the labor migrants, uh, particularly the contract workers who perform unskilled or treaty jobs. Um, and these are usually locked into a rotating door regime that enforces transit. These will be the three men up here, right, who do the hard work of construction, of uh, ship repair, uh, cleaning, and so forth. Uh, they basically uh, have um, pretty precarious jobs, um, and um, they are not, in a sense, allowed to lay down roots. They're expected to um, exit Singapore once their labor has been used. So in a sense, they are, in a sense, disposable labor. Um, so, and of course, there are many, many groups in between talent migration, migrants and labor migrants, but I, just to keep the story simple, I'm just going to uh, focus actually right now on the labor migrants. Okay? Because in terms of numbers, uh, these, the, the contract workers, uh, uh, basically number in very much, much larger numbers than, say, the talent migrants. 
So these, uh, the vast majority of these lowly paid migrant workers uh, transient labor and there are no pathways to residency or citizenship available for the, this very large group. So what we have here is the contradiction between a large migrant population that's supposed to be transient and, uh, but at the same time when you walk around Singapore there is the palpable visibility of migrant concentrations. So, so that is where the paradox is. They are expected to be transient, but of course, in terms of visibility, they are highly visible. And this has raised social anxieties, moral panics about the need to control and uh, tighten surveillance over this kind of, this this population. Okay, so, and um, so we have uh, these weekend on days and foreign local gatherings, like in Little India, like, uh, uh, there's a little Manila along Orchard Road, which is a shopping road, shopping street, and so forth. These are often seen uh, negatively, and um, there are usually petitions to ask authorities to step up security measures and to keep them out of sight. Um, and um, so forth. And in residents of the public housing flats in Little India, for example, have put us to barricades around their blocks to call them off uh, their area vis-a-vis uh, their -vis, you know, foreign workers. And uh, you see signs here, uh, like this one. Um, in Singapore, of course, these kinds of signage is quite common, but usually it will be just uh, fine and littered, right? No littering will be the most common. This one is a bit more than no littering, it's no urinating, no sleeping, and no eating. And it's in, in multiple languages in order to uh, speak to the foreign population. Of course, the sign is here, and nobody sort of bothers about this because they yeah, are the foreign workers uh, sleeping under the sign. And um, in Little India, um, the, there's been an increased level of auxiliary police who are there to move the workers on. So these kinds of um, issues came to a head again in 2013. I already spoken about the white people protest. Uh, 2013 was a special year for Singapore because things that never happened happened that year. We also had a riot, so which is uh, again we haven't had a riot of this scale since the 1950s. Uh, but uh, in, in December 2013, uh, a riot happened in Little India involving the foreign workers. Uh, after an uh, Indian construction worker was killed by the bus that was supposed to be ferrying the, the, the workers back from Little India to their dormitories. And um, so there was anger amongst the, the passersby, and basically there was a riot involving about 300 people uh, lasting about two hours. Of course, this is terribly serious in the, in the case of Singapore, where this hasn't happened before, so I won't go through all the debates and so forth. I just wanted to say that um, the aftermath, the, the after effects of that particular uh, riot was that uh, surveillance was tightened, so there's increased police surveillance in, in Little India. Alcohol sales was banned because uh, apparently one of the causes of the riot was the fact that uh, many, I don't know about the fact, but uh, it was said that uh, many of the workers were intoxicated. So, uh, and, um, but beyond the tightening surveillance over Little India, what is interesting is uh, the uh, increase in the spaces and enclosures outside of Little India in order to, to, in a sense, keep the workers away from Little India. And um, I will use this picture to, to a little bit more about it. So in 2013, 2014, particularly after the riots, these uh, mega dormitories were built and they usually built at the periphery of Singapore, far away from the center. Um, and these are very large dormitories for workers. This one contains 16,800 beds. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, not just a dormitory. It also has a mini mart, a beer garden, a food court. It's got a cricket field, it's got a cinema, it's got recreational facilities uh, in this space. And it, uh, I was looking at one of the advertisements uh, for this particular uh, dormitory. The positive dormitory it says that you can see, but it also has sea view. 
So it's almost like selling the condominium. So, and uh, this is to, in a sense, uh, keep the workers happy, I suppose, and well served within the dormitory so that they will minimize sort of workers having to, in a sense, go to their traditional enclave in Little India. Um, and um, so moving on, uh, just also wanted to say a little bit more about the flip side, so that you don't go away the impression that Singapore is all about control. There's also been uh, many sorts of uh, NGOs and uh, groups uh, that has come to the fore to, in a sense, um, work on the rights and welfare of migrant workers, something that you will not see, say, 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, basically, I call this basically the section care and cosmopolitan hope with a question mark. So there's a whole range of different NGOs offering services at soup kitchens, rather than soup kitchens, it's a curry kitchens, basically, uh, as well as uh, women's shelters, advocacy-oriented groups, and so forth, uh, in order to try to look into the welfare of um, um, foreign workers. Uh, and I just have got several clips, so I think I'll show you just one, which is how, in a sense, young Singaporeans are working together with, um, um, in this case, I think, lucky Bangladeshi construction workers in music making. So that uh, there's a sense that hopefully to uh, in, improve the sense of uh, belonging and integration into Singapore. So. Um, so this is, of course, some nights I stay up, cash in my bed up. Some nights I call it a troll. Some nights I wish that I should build a castle. Some nights I wish they just fall off. But I still wake up, I still see your nose. Spaces of the whole. So that's my um, uh, 
uh, for fee. So just as backdrop, basically um, uh, we all know that uh, fertility rates have plummeted to our low levels in many countries, including Taiwan, Singapore, and uh, Korea, Thailand, and so forth. So this has been aggravated. Uh, this is an aggravated trend of uh, rapid aging, so that uh, we have higher elderly dependency ratios, as well as um, uh, a care crisis, given that family units are now very small. So this particular graph, which um, you probably can't see very well, but it shows basically the declining trends amongst the different races. So uh, Chinese and Indian uh, populations have uh, start, start having declining fertility rates from day one. Uh, the Malay population kept it up for a while, the green line, but also by the last uh, 10 years or so, fallen below replacement. So, uh, as the, the caption says, Singapore's baby blues, the stock hasn't been doing its job, the population isn't replacing itself. So, um, in this particular context, What the care burden in the whole has now intensified. So, uh, Singapore women have been participating in the workforce uh, as part of the industrialization drive, uh, and they shoulder the triple burden of career building, child raising, and elder care. Um, so, Singaporean women, I think the uh, female labor participation rate is, in, is pretty high, 60 something. And uh, so but women's work is now even more challenging because this household division of labor by gender remains relatively rigidly drawn in, in many households. Essentially, uh, care work is done by women. It, it, it doesn't cross the gender divide very much. So apart from a career, ex-careers and, and looking after children, more recently, in the last 10 years or so, elder care has been a major issue. And as you can see, when you walk in the supermarkets, because instead of baby diapers, you now see family diapers, right? So on the shelves. Uh, and uh, that is, I think, uh, need to pay attention to this looming crisis of care in Asian societies. Uh, why? Because in Asian societies, the care for the elderly is often seen to be a family responsibility, at least traditionally. The family has always been the main support. But with the shrinking family sizes, you know, I mean, one child and no children, or children all abroad, basically, these uh, urban families in particular are faced with a, uh, a, 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 care, a, a, a care needs. So they have turned to external sources of care labor in the form of foreign domestic workers, and devolving the responsibility of caregiving uh, to foreign domestic workers in order to maintain dual career households and middle class lifestyles. Uh, I, I think this is a familiar story in Taiwan as well, so I will not go into it in great details. Uh, I really like this uh, phrase of Imiko Ochai, who is a, a, a professor in Kyoto. Uh, she coined the phrase liberal familialism, where the cost of purchasing the care labor is borne by the family, so you pay for the domestic worker. But where filial piety is outsourced others to services support from across the international borders. So, yes, filial piety or xiao basically is very important in these uh, societies like Singapore. So, uh, keeping the elderly at home, looking after the elderly is important, but it's the physical work of care is often not done by the, the sons and daughters themselves, it's done by the foreign domestic worker. Uh, here you have a picture of a foreign domestic worker, an Indonesian foreign domestic worker, watching a television drama with an elderly Singaporean employer, because they are the only ones at home, right, on their, in the afternoon. So here's my first quiz. What television drama are they watching? Since she only speaks, the foreign worker only speaks Indonesian, the elderly Singaporean probably only speaks Mandarin, what TV program are you watching? Which TV drama crosses language boundaries? To me, it's not popular here. In, in Singapore, you ask this, they all say Korean drama. <laughs> because uh, Korean drama is a kind, right? You don't really need to understand. Because 
I'm not a Korean diplomat because I, my, I go to the toilet and this means it's still the same currency. So, uh, so that's, that's in a sense uh, providing the companionship for the elderly uh, is in a sense uh, part of the performance of the party now devolved to uh, domestic workers. Um, and I've got a second question, a second quiz. So this one is a, a poster basically made by one of the NGOs to remind ourselves that the maid plays an important role in the family and yet there are times when we forget she exists. Uh, and I uh, just want to ask you what is interesting about this particular photograph. The clue is, is about the hand that rocks the cradle. What, 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 is, what is interesting, what is different? Is this, is this not just a very normal picture of a young couple with a baby? Yes? The hands. The hand, yes. The hands. What about the hand? The hands are about the mother's hands. Yes, the hand is of a darker color, right? Signifying that it's not the mom's hands. That's to say that to care for this little baby, it involves the, the, the efforts of not just the father, the mother, but also the domestic worker who is invisible in this particular picture. So that's, in a sense, it leads me to um, uh, show you a short clip, I think, uh, of uh, this award-winning uh, film called Hilo Hilo. Um, I know some of you may have seen it before. I'm just going to show you the trailer. Ilo Ilo is a province in um, the Philippines, but that's probably not as, in, as revealing as its Chinese title, which is Pana Kutai Jia. And uh, this is uh, a award winning film that won the Golden Camera Award, the first time in Singapore ever won anything. <laughs> so, and it's Anthony Chen's film is based on Anthony Chen, the director's own personal uh, uh, upbringing experience. So I'm just going to show you uh, the, the, the trailer to give you a sense of So moving quickly on, 
Um, basically, what I want to talk a little bit more about is that um, this outsourcing and risk and care work to Southeast Asian women from the less developed economies, basically by for privileged Singaporean women, uh, uh, the partial freedom from the burden of household reproductive labor, whilst of course the men continue to educate their responsibilities. So what's important is diversification is also found within the intimacy of the household where care functions are increasingly dependent on international migrants. Um, and uh, I hardly have any more time, but I actually wanted to talk a bit more about um, the fact that uh, whilst the middle class households can recruit migrant domestic workers for household purposes, working class households that cannot afford the domestic worker basically uh, draw on the unpaid care labor by recruiting foreign brides. And I know this is a phenomenon is in, in Taiwan as well, uh, where particularly working class men from the lower income groups basically feel that they are very left behind by local women. Uh, who do not want to marry them, so they often uh, engage in international marriage with uh, women from the region, from Vietnam, from Indonesia, Philippines, and so forth. And these uh, foreign rights then become sort of unpaid caregiver in the whole. Um, and um, so, just in, in Singapore, 30% um, of all marriages registered every year is between a citizen and a non citizen. That's how high it is. So it's like one in three marriages is with a foreigner. Of course, uh, this would be a very wealthy foreigner, but the bulk of it would be to, uh, between Singaporean men and uh, women from the less developed countries. And as you see in this particular uh, matchmaking agency's uh, title, we give you a reason why, they, they, how they advertise, you know, uh, so this is obviously a, a, a slap in the face of Singaporean women that can no longer do that, so um, they advertise sort of uh, the Vietnamese marriage market to, to fulfill that particular role. So and um, the, so what's what's what I want to say is that given this kind of diversification within the family, right, uh, in terms of domestic workers as well as in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of marriage migrants, in January 2010, uh, there was a policy to allow children of mixed marriages, uh, or the parents of, of these children, to choose between adopting a race of either father or mother or to use double barrel hyphenated race classifications. So the PM basically announced this strategy because of the large numbers of Singaporeans marrying across racial lines. He says the couples consider how their kid will be brought up and what their kid's identity will be. Will they Chinese kid, Indian kid, maybe European, maybe Japanese, maybe Vietnamese? And he even talks about how many Singaporeans are married Vietnamese women. Uh, so it, it, so situations like uh, in Singapore, uh, this is a, a trick question. Uh, say you have a Chinese mother and an Indian father, what do you take, right, on the form when they ask for your race? So you take Chinese, Indian, and Chinian, basically. <laughs> so this kind of uh, mix, mixing of um, suggests that hybridity is very much part of the family nowadays. So. This policy is to try to liberalize sort of um, uh, people's identity politics. And I don't have time to go into that. I'm just going to finish off now. That uh, this kind of, but this liberalization of identity politics in Singapore is not the same as widening the base for case making in cultural rights because for administrative purposes, they will still follow the race before the hyphen. So, what language are you supposed to, to learn in schools? Doesn't, if, if, if you choose to hyphenate the two races, depends on what you put before the hyphen. So, there are a, a series of different issues to do with that. But at the same time, I think the active recognition of hyphenated identities is a step forward in uh, thinking about race in a more cosmopolitan frame. Um, I won't go to my conclusion because um, I think uh, there's just not time. I just leave uh, the slide there 
and we will stop because I think there's less than six minutes for questions. Thank you very much. for Brenda's wonderful presentation. She um, has five parts for his uh, for her presentations. Uh, she talked about she, um, national level and then to um, individual level. And she talks about um, the public spheres and then um, uh, private spheres. Um, we have five or uh, six more minutes. Is there any questions or comments for Brenda? Please. Thank you, Brenda. I really, really enjoy your talk. Uh, and uh, I think I learned a great deal from uh, your talk about Singapore. Uh, just a very small question, more than a question, to show that I really pay attention to your talk. That uh, I, I saw this picture that you put on national, national building and the management of diversity. It actually showed that pictures of children uh, hanging, hanging, holding hands together. But uh, about their hands, they actually like put an English lit, uh, S and an English G. <laughs> is there any meaning for the S and G? Okay, and that's just a short simple. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, so never mind. But uh, one question is uh, that you mentioned about the, uh, the hyphenated, uh, actually, race identity. I was wondering, uh, since in Taiwan, in this year, May 17th, we just passed this. Uh, like a same marriage law. So I was wondering what happened uh, in Singapore about this like sexual identity or gender identity things that you have. And also, what comment, just before you answer it. I, I was thinking that actually, um, uh, as a psychologist, I want to uh, know whether that perhaps after the year 2000, actually in psychology, we actually made a huge a uh, bunch of energies sent was, was studying the multicultural mind or bicultural identity and uh, we, we actually know that actually uh, people who know uh, like many cultures actually perform much better in a lot of things so perhaps that uh, in your uh, center they also have this kind of study that actually tell us that Singaporeans actually uh, compared to people around the world uh, you do have a lot of multicultural mind and you do perform well with this uh, bicultural identity um, and preferences. Thank you. Uh, the answer to the first question about same-sex marriages uh, is a very short one. Basically, it's, uh, it takes a very different, um, it, it's a, a very different platform from uh, issues to do with race, culture and identity. And um, right now, basically, uh, I would say that it's still very much in discussion. I mean, it's highly contested uh, amongst uh, the, the different segments of the population. And of course, religion comes into this. We do have uh, um, not just um, Christians, but also uh, is Muslims, a, a, a very important Muslim population as well. So uh, that, I think, is going to be quite a, um, difficult to make for Singapore. Uh, on the question of, uh, your second question was to do with uh, of, of, of studying sort of, uh, in a sense, the creative um, energies that you can get from uh, cultural hybridity. I think that's a very important topic and uh, we currently have a, a quite a big project which is to do with, um, uh, we're interviewing sort of marriage, uh, international marriage families and looking at the parenting uh, behavior, not just looking at it in, uh, in, in terms of all the constraints, but also looking at how um, parents in a hybrid family basically uh, put together the resources and how this might enrich the, the learning abilities of the children. So instead of seeing sorts of hybridity as something that's uh, deficit driven, but to also look into the positives and the creativity that can come from it. So, uh, probably so far behind the kind of work that's done here, but uh, it's been. Thank you. Any questions? Please, please. Uh, hello, Professor. 
I just have two small questions. So I noticed that you said on the statistics, Chinese population accounts for 74% of Singaporean citizens. Is it intentional, intentionally to make it like this, or it just happened to be by chance? And my second question is, uh, on the Singaporean identity card, do you need to specify which race you are in? Thank you. So the second question is, I think, yes, I have to do. So uh, in, in, in Singapore, and I guess in some parts of the world, race is not a seen as a dirty word. So it's asked everywhere. So um, on your identity class, it's stated. So um, almost every form that you fill basically ask for your race. So, uh, and um, that's, that's partly because, as I mentioned, it's is a colonial legacy, so racial categories have been hardened uh, during the long colonial period and when we inherited it, the uh, political leaders of that time felt that uh, it's not something that you could easily sort of dismantle. Um, so, um, and therefore a separate but equal multi-racialism kind of policy, right? This policy that depends on separate racial categories is increasingly challenged these days by global forces and the new diversities I'm talking about, as well as inter-cultural marriages and so forth. So, so the big question in Singapore is, is CMI going to survive the next generation? Um, the uh, Prime Minister came up um, last year saying that race is still very important for Singapore. We can't ignore it. Um, um, at the same time, I think there's acknowledgement that uh, there's going to be many race complexities that we do. Is your, your first question has to do with ethnic composition, um, the 70 something percent Chinese, the, the 13 40 percent uh, Malays, uh, about 7 9 percent Indians, and then a small percentage of others. Um, is, not stated anywhere in policy documents, but I think it's uh, clear that in Singapore, given this sort of racial policy, the idea is that um, if the, the migrants come in these categories, if they're Chinese, Malay, and Indians, and they can, in a sense, uh, it is they, easier for them to integrate. Okay, of course, this is a big question. I, I don't think it's as simple as that. Uh, looking at the, the kinds of reactions against um, the new Chinese and, it, and new Indians that come to Singapore, but the idea is that it's easier for them to integrate than, say, uh, somebody from Africa or Europe or wherever. So, the, nothing in Singapore is not planned for, so, uh, so the answer would be that um, I'm sure there's careful planning behind the scenes as to how to maintain the racial arithmetics in Singapore so that there are no large shifts. There are small changes, but no large shifts. Well, any more questions, please, please? Hi, Professor. Um, I want to ask a question like, to compare Singapore and Taiwan. Would you turn off the number one? There's a number one so, yeah, because um, do, do, according to your uh, speech, I can see that the four MS is the uh, characteristic of Singapore, and um, Taiwan is somehow uh, proud of our multicultural reason. But uh, sometimes, uh, due to, due to the uh, colonial uh, historical problem. Many Taiwanese doesn't know uh, what Taiwanese culture is. Yeah, we we are still finding our Taiwanness. So, big, so, what do you think is Singapore Singaporeness? Uh, providing that the multiracial and the cultural uh, background is the best. That's that's a very important question and. Um, uh, the short answer is I think uh, we haven't really arrived at what constitutes Singapore identity. There has been uh, an experiment for the last 50 years since independence, so we are about 50, 53, uh, 54 years old uh, today. Uh, and uh, basically, 
Uh, there's been many different kinds of experiments, including uh, a national anthem, a national flag, the symbols of nationalism, of course, have been already put in place. Uh, much of, I would say, Singaporean identity is partly dependent on what's been called economic nationalism. So it cannot be divorced from how uh, well and uh, whether Singapore affords uh, for its people uh, a livelihood that, uh, and, and, and is able to fit in people's aspirations. So I think that identity question is never just a, a cultural one. It is one that is, in a sense, also tied to the, um, the economic well-being of the nation state. On the cultural front, of course, there is now in Singapore um, um, heritage organisations. We have the National Heritage Board, which uh, is fairly new um, from the 1980s. And what its primary goals is to, in a sense, draw on heritage as a resource for identity building. Right? And what is this heritage? This heritage is multicultural, multiracial, multilingual. And uh, increasingly, uh, well, if you, if you go to Singapore 20 years ago, it's already a cultural desert. But today, uh, many of the heritage organizations, the museums, the, the, the heritage centers, and so forth, in a sense, tell the story of how uh, these different cultures have come together to live relatively peacefully together uh, in an uh, environment of uh, acceptance and so forth. And it's not not uh, unusual in Singapore to walk along the streets and find a uh, Chinese temple next to a Malay mosque next to an Indian temple. And then further down the road is a Christian church. So that is not, in fact, part of the planet in Singapore that every uh, Precinct, every housing precinct basically has to cater for um, at least these four main religions um, on the ground. So, so the question is, I think Singapore tried very hard. Uh, it does have quite an uh, important challenge because it's, it's as I said, multiracial, multicultural from day one, and now we have new sort of diversities coming in. I think the the old formula. We, we know what to do with the old form, the, the same kind of how to, in a sense, bring people together. That has been the experiment of the last few years. The new challenge is how do you then integrate the new migrant led universities that no longer necessarily just fall within CMIO uh, into uh, the space of Singapore. Uh, I would love to hear a bit more, I mean, perhaps at some time or whatever, about the Taiwan's uh, efforts at identity. I don't know. Um, it's a long time to end this session. Um, if you have any questions, you probably can discuss after the uh, lunch. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, we are happy, very happy to have going back here to learn about Singapore and know more about migration, immigration, that kind of stuff. I think we have lots to do. We have to try very hard, and there are many, many challenges for us. Uh, for Taiwan or for Singapore, we say. Okay, let's thank Brenda very much. Everybody.